Good evening. It is good to see everyone here this evening. As you are probably aware at this point, we talked about it uh, leading up to, and then as we started last week, we are in a new class that we're looking at the idea of tactics. And that is based both on the fact that the book we're going through is named Tactics, but also, as we talked a little bit last week, the idea of what we're talking about is giving us practical, tangible tactics to use as we talk with those around us about God, about his word, especially, I mean, really, these, these things we're talking about, ultimately, they can be used very effectively in any kind of conversation with people about something that there's a disagreement about. Now, I would advise that our focus be on the things of Christ and the gospel that's being, uh, that, that is our priority in spreading to people, but ultimately, these are not just confined to religious discussions. These are just things that will help you be a better communicator and be a better, uh, uh, what shall I say, interactor <laughs> with other people and, and also know how to kind of diffuse situations as well. We'll get to that as well. Uh, all that being said, we talked last week uh, kind of giving us a, a sense of some of the principles we'll be looking at. We talked about this idea of taking a fort. And the idea being, number one, we're in a battle, we're in a war. That's uh, something we should never forget as Christians. So using that kind of military type metaphor, if we are trying to talk with someone who has their defenses up, someone who doesn't agree with us about something about the gospel or maybe anything about the gospel, and we know they have their defenses up, meaning we know they disagree, we don't want to just run head on into their defenses and beat our, our heads against the brick wall, right? Any more than if you were a general and there is a solid fortified position in front of you, you don't just slam into the front of it. You're going to take way more losses and you're probably going to be repulsed from that position. You see the, the nerdiness coming out, right? And that my love of military stuff. But you're not going to do that. You're going to either find a weak point, you're going to try and shell the fortification until there's a breach in the walls, and whatever the case might be, you're going to try and avoid just a frontal assault on a fortified position. Well, that's the same thing that we're talking about when we're talking about this idea of tactics and talking with people. Don't pick a fight with someone when you have an opportunity to find a way around their defenses, when you have an opportunity to find perhaps common ground, to ask questions, that's a big part of what we talked about last week, maybe you don't need to answer their question or their statement or their accusation. Maybe you just need to respond to the question and we'll leave the rest for later. So tonight we're going to follow that up with another concept. Again, I encourage you all to get this book. Right now, we haven't even gotten the first chapter. We're just talking about a couple of introductory concepts that he gives at the very beginning in the foreword to the book. We're going to talk tonight about gardening. Now, obviously, we're not talking literally about gardening. So the ladies were like, oh, yay, I love this. I know a lot about this stuff, right? But we are going to use this as a metaphor because uh, there are a lot of aspects of this that I think are very important for us. So as we talk about gardening and being a gardener, I want us to think about the parable of the sower. So Jesus starts this parable off, right? Sower went out to sow. As he sowed, some seeds fall on the path, some seeds fall on rocky ground, thorny ground, good ground. And we, we know that parable. But in the parable, and we know this because of the explanation that Jesus gives, one of the rare times he actually gives us the interpretation of the parable, what is happening in this parable? What, what is the seed that's being sown? The gospel. The message of Christ, that's the seed that's being sown. The sower, in this case, ultimately we have Christ initially being the one sharing this good news, but then his, his people, the disciples, the church ultimately, are the ones sharing this good news. This is the metaphor that he uses, the, the, the example he uses, though, this idea of sowing seed, which will ultimately sprout up and become producing what? plants, or, or uh, what's the, the term that I'm looking for? Uh, ah, it'll come to me. But uh, whether it's something that's producing like uh, grain or uh, vegetables, fruits, whatever the case might be, that's the goal ultimately. But I want us to think about the process that's alluded to here. Now, obviously, Jesus doesn't go into this in the parable, but by using this metaphor, there are some things we can think about. Whenever you're going to farm or garden, and many of y'all know this with way more uh, firsthand knowledge than I do. 
But whenever you're going to farm or you're going to garden, there's a lot of preparation that goes into it. Is that fair? <laughs> Y'all who have a lot more experience than I do, right? There's a lot of preparation that goes into it. And there's also a lot of tending. After you've done the preparation part, there's a lot of tending. Ultimately, there's a lot of time that you are investing in the process of growing something. And the reason we say that is this. Any of y'all who have ever done any gardening, farming, anything like that, would you expect to harvest a day after you've planted the seed? Or maybe not a day, maybe that's too much, maybe a week after you plant the seed. Or maybe even that's too much, a month after you planted that first seed. Would you expect to harvest? That's not how it works, is it? It takes a lot of time for a seed, once planted in soil, to sprout and then to grow, and then ultimately to bear fruit, as the uh, Gospels describe it, meaning to produce whatever it's supposed to produce. Again, whether that's grain, vegetable, fruit, cotton, right? Whatever we're talking about, that takes a lot of time. So there's the preparing of the soil, the tending of the soil, and then finally, eventually, after a lot of time, the harvesting from the mature plant. That metaphor we need to think of a little more when we're talking about sharing the gospel with people. Because usually when we think of this metaphor, whether we realize it or not, we think of this metaphor primarily in terms of, I plant the seed, I harvest. And we skip that entire middle section. Again, we may not realize that's what we're doing, but a lot of times that's what happens. Whenever we talk with others about Jesus, what is our goal? Ultimately, what do we want to happen? The end result of, I, I talk with someone about Jesus, what, what do I want to happen? I would like to see him become a Christian. I want to see him become a Christian. Not only that, I want to see him become a Christian and live a faithful Christian life for as long as they're here on this earth. That's my goal. I think that both with the metaphors that Jesus and others in the New Testament use, and also just how we would normally use it, that's called the harvest, right? That's where the full maturity of what we're trying to accomplish has been accomplished. That's the harvest. The problem is that doesn't happen overnight. If we're going to use this metaphor, we need to think of it in these terms. I plant the seed. I talk with the person. I, I, I put the first ideas of the gospel in their minds. But there's a lot of time of trying to sometimes prepare them, even for me to bring up Jesus in the first place, especially if people, for example, have become jaded against the idea of religion or the church, which there are more and more people like that in our society now. Sometimes there's a lot of preparation that has to go into it before they'll even listen to you bring up Jesus. And then after you bring up Jesus, there's usually a lot of tending of the soil and this new plant that's springing up, if you will, before they're going to actually, all right, I actually believe this now. I'm willing to make a commitment. There's a lot of time involved there. It varies on the individual, right? No two people are going to be in exactly the same spot, have exactly the same mindset, exactly the same process from not believing to believing. It's going to vary by person. But no matter what, it's going to take time. I'm afraid, and I've even talked with some of y'all personally about this, I'm afraid that sometimes, and when I say talk with y'all, I mean y'all have brought this up and said, this, this has been something that I've struggled with as well. Because we're so excited for, as Ralph said, that end goal, we want that harvest. Because we're so excited to see someone become a Christian, sometimes we focus so much on that that we want to skip all the time in between. We want to shortcut it as, as much as possible. We want to get as quickly from planting the seed to the harvest as possible. And sometimes that causes way more harm than good. Now, I, I get the sentiment. I'm not criticizing the sentiment. Is there an urgency to someone who is lost becoming saved? If we forget that there's an urgency, we're making a mistake, right? There's no doubt there's urgency there. But... I want us to think about this. Is it ever a waste of time to help someone put together one more piece of the puzzle? 
And what I mean by that is, let's say I have a conversation. Liz, you're now a non-Christian. I'm having a conversation with you, all right? So I bump into Liz, random person on the street, and we have this random conversation. We never see each other again after this one conversation. I'm probably not going to convert her in a 5, 10, 15 minute conversation on the street. But you know what I can maybe do? I might be able to help her put one more piece of the puzzle together. Is that a waste of time? I hope we don't think it is. But I'm afraid, while we would never say, I don't think, that's a waste of time, in our minds we think, well, yeah, but you didn't get her from not being a Christian to being a Christian. Yeah, that's true. Am I likely going to be effective if I try and rush that process in a 15-minute conversation? No. Even if this is someone I know. Okay, now, Liz, you're a friend of mine that I don't know super well, but we see each other every once in a while. I'm probably not going to get there in two or three or four conversations either. But you know what I can do every conversation? I can help her put one more piece of the puzzle in place. And if I never get to the point where I get to be involved in her finally obeying the gospel, guess what I've done? Go back to our metaphor. I've helped prepare and tend that soil to where someone else can bring the harvest. You see, our tendency is to try and overload. And I say this about myself because I've been guilty of this plenty of times in the past. Our tendency is to try and shortcut so that we end up giving all the information we know the person needs, but we try and give it all at once. And when I say all at once, maybe not all in one conversation, but we can press it. We don't give them any time to process, to make it real, to accept the truth of what we're giving them. We overwhelm them and ultimately drives them away. Now, we said this before, but I want to say it again, especially in the context of this class. I'm just going to throw a figure out here. I'm not saying it should or shouldn't take this long. If I take a year to help a person truly internalize and believe the message of the gospel, and they become a Christian, and it is embedded in their core, if we're going back to the parable of the sower, their good soil, because I have worked with them for that year to cultivate that good soil, and they remain a Christian because they have a foundation, versus if I can pressure someone or overwhelm someone or convince someone, oh, this is what you're supposed to do, but they really don't understand why. They really don't have all the, 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 the basis for it. They just know this is what you're supposed to do. And the preacher told me this is what you're supposed to do. And you're supposed to do what the preacher tells you to do. And it's never really real for them. It's just something they feel like someone else has told them to do and they do it. And that process takes a month. Which is time better spent? Well, but in 12 months, you could baptize 12 people. Yeah, and how many of those people actually converted? Again, a conversation I've had with one of y'all uh, in particular that I remember talking about how, yeah, there's a lot of people that maybe we baptized, but how many did we actually convert? When we talk about gardening tonight, here's what I want us to think about. I don't have to be the one who reaps the harvest. You don't have to be the one that reaps the harvest. If I can be instrumental in putting one more piece of the puzzle in place, helping that person get a little closer to where they need to be, I may never know what happens next, depending on the situation. I would love to. I would love every conversation I've had about the Bible, about Jesus, with everyone that I've ever had that conversation with, I would love to know what happens. I'm not going to. And I need to stop focusing on being the one who has that last conversation that results in baptism. I want to be 
that person if I can be, and if I'm in the right position to be, if they're in the right position to be, but any conversation I can have where I can help one more piece of the puzzle fit into their minds, where I can prepare the soil just a little bit better for that seed to sprout, that's not a waste of conversation. By contrast, how many people does it take ultimately to prepare someone to obey the gospel versus the person that closes the deal, if you will? I would venture to guess, even just among us, if we were to talk about our conversions, I would venture to guess that most of us had a lot more people who helped prepare us than the person who actually baptized us, or maybe had those last few studies and were baptized. So as Christians, we need to think more in terms, not just of harvesting, that's absolutely not something we're taking off the table. Our goal needs to be to do whatever we can to move forward, even if that doesn't get them in that conversation to where we know they eventually need to be. Think about this. Paul stands up, we sometimes call it Mars Hill, uh, the Areopagus is the more technical term. Paul stands up on the Areopagus, this is in Athens, a Greek city, a pagan city, steeped in the religion of the Greeks, and even under Rome, still ultimately, Rome just stole Greek religion anyway, so still ultimately a very, very central religious area for this entire region. He stands up in the midst of all these temples. I mean, literally, if you look at pictures of the Areopagus, he is standing with a backdrop of just dozens of temples. If you had a camera there, he would just, that would be his background. And he begins, he says, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious, or the word might be very pious. You care about the, the things of the gods. Is what he's saying. Okay. That's a that's a way to start, right? You know what Paul doesn't do as he continues his speech? Paul continues his speech, he tells them about the one true God, trying to uh, kind of make this connection between the gods generally and the one true God. The gods, of course, not existing, but the one true God being the one who exists. And he ultimately tells them that this God has made possible a resurrection from the dead and all these kind of things. You know it's not included in his speech? Anybody know? Okay. One thing is he never tries to, uh, here's an idea, let me bash it down. Now, he does that kind of in a side sideline way in the sense that he tells what's true, and that implies that some of these things are false. What else, though? What else is not included in his delivery? He doesn't tell them they're wrong. Okay. He doesn't really just explicitly, uh, you know, like the Jews, for example, right? Some of Paul's uh, message to the Jews, y'all need to stop, right? <laughs> no, he doesn't do that. What else, though? What else does Paul not do here? Now that I've told you about this one God and his son, here's what you need to do. Repent, and all of, we, all of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. He doesn't do that. Why doesn't Paul do that at the end of his message to the Athenians? It won't work. He, he gave them an idea to think about. Mm -hmm. He wanted them to think and like the rock in the shoe. They're not ready for that yet. He knows they're not ready for that yet. He's not trying to shortcut this. They need the next piece of the puzzle. And that next piece of the puzzle is not obeying the gospel yet. Is that Paul's goal? Do you think Paul is not wanting the Athenians to obey the gospel? Do you think Paul omits that part because he doesn't want them to obey the gospel? He's planting the seed. Good. Paul even says something like that, doesn't he? I planted, Apollos watered, God gave the increase. He knows this is a process. 
He doesn't call them to uh, repent and be baptized because they don't even understand the one true God yet. That's the piece of the puzzle he's working on right now. This is what we're talking about when we're talking about gardening. When I talk to someone who isn't where they need to be in their relationship with God, whether they don't believe in God at all, whether they do, but they don't have some understanding correct, or whatever the case might be, whatever point they're at, when I have a conversation with them, I need to have a mindset of a gardener. Now, as a gardener, are you sometimes going to be fortunate enough to be there for the harvest? Absolutely. And if that's the point at which the soil and the seed that sprouted is, that's great. But first and foremost, I would argue, we need to have the mindset, I'm going to try and get them towards the next point they need to be at, the next stage of their growth. And that may or may not be obeying the gospel. For most people, that's not where they're at right now. For most people, the next stage is, like Ralph said, sticking a pebble in their shoe. I know, perhaps, they believe this or that. Let me put just enough doubt in that false idea without ever attacking it, right? Let me just ask them some questions that, that gets them moving away from that idea to where they really need to be. If I can do that, if I can move them in the right direction in that conversation, I've accomplished something. The idea that somehow my interactions with people always have to end in baptisms, whether we're talking about me as the preacher or any of us, you realize what that does, right? Not only does that encourage us to rush things, to take shortcuts, but it also kind of sets us up for failure. Because if I believe I really haven't done that much in any kind of conversation or evangelism, unless I'm baptizing people, you know what that does. That's, well, I've had a lot of conversations so far, and I haven't baptized anybody, so I should probably just try, stop trying, because I haven't been doing my job, obviously. That's not how this works. The problem is, we may never know what happens as a result of our efforts. But that's where we trust God. God gives the increase, right? To use that metaphor, of course, he's not talking about this particular idea in that verse, but that's it's the same point. God's the one who's going to give the increase. I'm doing what I can based on where they are and the opportunity that I have. I would much rather get someone one step closer to true conversion then rush them into the waters of baptism while they don't really understand what's going on. Not every person or situation naturally lends itself to a harvest. And when I say naturally, I don't mean we just stand back and let things happen. No, I'm moving them in that direction. Or may not be there yet. This may not be a pulling the fruit off the vine. This may be a Fertilizing the soil, watering the soil, pulling the weeds situation. So as we wrap up for tonight, this is the second concept I really want us to cement in our minds. I've told you all before as we started this, these are principles that I kind of had bits and pieces of for a while. But I still, until very recently, have had this mindset in the back of my mind, if I'm getting evangelized, that means I'm getting someone all the way from point A to point B. My job is to get them however far I can get them and trust God for the rest. But I do them and myself a disservice if I try and rush it. Because I want them to convert. I don't just want to dunk them in the water. I want them to truly become Christians not just become consumers of churchness, which is all too big of a problem in our society. We're not always going to be in a position where I get to harvest. We can always be in a position to till the soil, to prepare it, to help people get one step closer. That's what this book and this class is about. Ultimately, yes, in the long term, this book is designed to get us 
thinking in a way that will hopefully result in harvest, whether we get to be participants of that or not. But the point is that we're being given the tactics, the practical ways that we can get people to the next step, whatever that next step is, that we can get people thinking, that we can get people just moving from where they are to where they need to be a little further and a little further. And whatever role we get to play in that, we trust that God will provide. Not that we're going to cut ourselves off. If we have the opportunity, we'll stay with them to the end, of course. But we don't always have that opportunity. You know, I think about it, for example, and I'm not meaning this as a downer in any way, but listen, I won't be here in this community for, you know, we'll be here for a few more months. If my mindset is I'm only going to talk to people if I think I can get them, you know, from not believing in God to baptism, well, I'm only going to try and talk to a few people because there's only a few people that may be uh, at that stage, right? But if my mindset is, you know what? If I have to leave before they have converted, someone else is going to come along and they can help them when I'm gone. Well, now all of a sudden, every conversation I have has the potential to move them closer. And I trust that I won't be the last one to talk to them. Because the church is here. We are here. That's the point. We're not the only ones doing this job. Now, I'm going to do everything I can. I hope all of us are going to do everything we can. We're not leaving it to someone else. It's their job to do in that sense. But it doesn't matter if I don't get them all the way. I got them part of the way. It's a team effort. Anyone can be a gardener. You may never be at the final stage where you get to see someone that you've talked to, that you've studied with, that you've asked questions of, and you may never get, be at the point where you get to see them or participate in the process of them converting and becoming a Christian. You may never get there. I hope you do. It's, it's a wonderful experience. But if you're a gardener, you've been part of the process, even if you don't get to see them. And we can all be part of that. The harvest is plentiful, Jesus said. The laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Now, you might think, well, wait a minute, we just said we're not talking about the harvest, we're talking about the gardening. You realize Jesus is saying this as he's looking out over Judea. God had been gardening in Judea for over a thousand years. That's why the harvest was white. That's why the harvest was ready. Because God had been preparing the soil. So if God felt like it was that important to spend that much time in human history preparing soil for the coming of his son, I think that it's okay for us to recognize it sometimes takes time, and we don't need to rush the process. Our goal is true converts, not simply more names on the roll or more bodies in the water. Harvest is the end goal. But if we don't have enough gardeners, there won't be harvest. That's all there's to it. And while many of us may not see ourselves as being the harvesters, every single one of us can be and should be a gardener. Any thoughts or comments as we close? We'll get into, Lord willing, more of the meat of the book. Uh, not next week, of course, but the week after that when we're back. Looking forward to that. I just wanted to throw those two principles out there at the outset because I think those are vital for us to understand as we begin to get into the very uh, nitty-gritty practical side uh, that the book looks at. As always, Lord's invitation is open. If there is anything we can do to encourage, to pray for you uh, this evening, please listen to as we stand and sing together. It's so sweet to trust in Jesus.